further reading. Thank you, everyone, for being here. It was a long walk up. I was in the back. <laughs> Your patience is appreciated. Um, if you if you are joining us in the in the midst here of this sermon series in First Peter, I encourage you to go back through some past sermons or back through the text. You know, we're picking up here in chapter three. And there's a lot to handle in this text, but there's also a lot of context, obviously, that came from those first couple of chapters as well, which we'll reference and we'll kind of keep working through. But if you, if you haven't worked through 1 Peter, I encourage you to refresh yourself a little bit with those first few chapters. Um, well, let's just dive in, you know, because the text is long today. You know, so, so Peter really starts out this section with this, finally. He wants to wrap up the central teachings of the last few chapters for us readers and remind us and remind the reader of their calling in Christ. And so what is this wrap-up or this summary that he wants us all and he wants the the church to be reminded of? It's really that that all of us are to follow the pattern of Christ in all relationships. This pattern that Deirdre and George have been going over, the pattern of doing good, enduring suffering, and blessing those who harm you, right? This pattern of Christ. And in every sphere, in every relationship, that's the pattern for a Christian to follow. And going back through chapters two, you know, that's the pattern for a Christian under an unjust government. That's the pattern for uh, an employee with an unjust boss. That's the, empl- that's the pattern for a wife with an unjust husband, a husband with an unjust wife. All circumstances, neighbors, coworkers, this enduring suffering, holding on to hope and blessing those who harm you. So he's calling the community here at the end as this kind of final wrap-up then. As a community, they are to endure suffering with unity, love, and humility, not repaying evil for evil, but rather blessing their enemies, blessing the people who are looking to harm them. And Peter describes this as their calling. So this, this is your calling. And by doing that, by using this term, he's really... It's, it's helpful, and he's really driving home for them and for us as readers that this is not an optional or secondary teaching for them, that if they have time or the capacity or the gifts, they should bless their enemies, or they should endure this suffering, but rather this is, this is it. This is the centerpiece. This is the very center of Christian ethics, the teachings of Jesus. It is to bless those who harm you, to endure suffering, and to love others especially our enemies. Those who seek to do us harm are the ones that we are to bless. There's no escaping it, no getting around it. It's the very calling of the Christian community. I mean, if you're looking for what separates Christian ethics from all other religion ethics, philosophies, it's this. No other religion or philosophy has ever taught to love your enemies. They've always taught to love your friends, to love those who love you, But no one has ever taught that this is what we are called to, is to love our enemies, to be a blessing to the very people, to the very groups that despise us, that revile us, that slander us, that these are the ones that we are to bless. He defines this characteristic as the defining characteristic of the Christian community, this humble love and blessing other people. He references back here, this is that last part of it, the quote is from Psalm 34, which again, he's just trying to emphasize, like none of this teaching is new. Jesus didn't make it up. Peter's not making up this teaching. This goes all the way back to Psalms. It goes all the way back to Abraham, this promise and hope to be a blessing. God's people were always to be a blessing. We're always supposed to bless this pattern of living of doing good, of suffering, and of blessing those who hurt us is the calling of Christians. So Peter really wants to wrap this up for the reader. Coming out of all those different spheres out of chapter 2, this is it. This is the life that we've all been called to in Jesus Christ, a gracious life, a life in which we will be generous, a life that is winsome to others in the midst of suffering and hostility. And then in verses 13 through 17, he really gets pretty specific. Because up to, I mean, at this point, it's just this kind of high up idea of be a blessing and enduring suffering. In 13 through 17, it gets fairly specific as to what this life looks like. And it looks like a life that is not afraid or troubled. A life that's not afraid and troubled, and a life that's ready to give an explanation, to give a defense for why we live the way that we live why we endure suffering the way we endure suffering, and why we bless 
people who are actually harming us. And as we give a defense, we're supposed to be gentle and respectful in how we explain ourselves, no matter how we are treated or no matter how we are asked or who it is that's doing the asking. But this readiness to give a defense is supposed to be gentle and respectful. And in this way, we'll have a good or a clear conscience in how we interact with other people. And those people will either be put to shame because of our conduct, because of how we've responded to the mistreatments and to the suffering of this world, or they'll be won over to Christ themselves, which, is, which has been that pattern that Peter's laid out all the way through. By following this pattern of Christ, you put to shame and you win to Christ. This enduring of suffering and blessing and being ready to give this defense, Peter says, right? We should all be ready to give this defense. Now, what's helpful here, though, is Peter does kind of give some he does two things that I think really helps to give some legs to these ideas for us, or just some context to help us think through how we're to actually live out these teachings. Because I think a lot of us, if you've grown up Christian or if you've been around the Christian church for a long time, you've, you may have heard these verses or like be ready to give a defense for the, the hope that you have. And Peter helps to kind of really give us those some, some handholds, some things to hold on to as we go through it. Right, The context for this gracious and winsome life, right? The first thing he does is he puts it into a context. He doesn't just leave it in this idea state or just a general calling, but rather he puts it, be ready to give a defense in the context of being misunderstood, being disregarded, being slandered, being reviled. Right? He understands the context of the original audience, right? And, and George did great on this in those early sermons, right? I mean, this, these are a people that have been forced into exile. They were in Rome. They were early converts to Christianity due to a lot of the political circumstances in Rome and the treatment of the Jews in Rome. All the Jews had been kicked out and forced to move to various places. Uh, and these, they were forced to move to Asia Minor. They're, they're living in a place that's not their land, that's not their home. They had to forfeit their livelihoods. They're now in a place very different from where they lived. They are forced into exile. They are completely misunderstood. I mean, nobody knows who a Christian is at this point. They just assume that they are Jews. They don't understand that really what Christianity is. And as they start to understand more and more about Christianity, they, the early Christians are getting slandered. All kinds of rumors are being talked about what Christians actually do when they gather together. And it's not a legal religion to be a Christian in Rome. It was legal to be a Jew, and you had protections being a Jew, but there are no protections in being a Christian. They're not protected. They're being misunderstood and slandered. It, it helps to make sense why Peter may be concerned about giving a gentle and respectful response when asked. They are homesick, misunderstood, spoken badly of, and mistreated. It would be very easy and understandable to respond with anger to the governing authorities, to anyone who approaches you about your faith and belief in the life that you are living. And it helps us then, I think by putting it in this context, it, it helps us as readers and for, to prepare for the context of our own calling as well. You know, it prepares us for our context for demonstrating this pattern of Christ. Because I think all of us would much rather prefer to live a gracious and winsome life that was free of suffering and mistreatment that didn't have people slander or revile or speak badly of. We would all love that, but that isn't promised in Scripture or described or anything, but rather the opposite is what is promised. Jesus tells his followers this, and Peter tells the church as well. And this is what it is to follow Christ. You will be rejected. You will be mistreated. You will be in these positions. We aren't to lose hope when we suffer, Rather, we're to see it as an opportunity to follow Christ. Because without being misunderstood and slandered and reviled, we can't follow that pattern of Christ. We have to have that suffering on the front end to be able to endure that suffering and to bless the people who are mistreating us. The second thing that Peter does, besides just putting it into that context of suffering that helps, the second thing he does is he, it's also helpful um, that he isn't very concerned with the content of the defense but rather is much more concerned with the character of the defense of your hope. A Christian defense of the gospel, right, or a presentation of the gospel should be marked 
by gentleness and respect, especially to those who don't show gentleness and respect to Christians. Because again, a lot of attention is given to this verse to support the idea that everybody needs to prepare themselves with all kinds of apologetic arguments and knowledge and being ready to kind of give an articulate answer or to know what to say in that moment when you have to, you're put on the spot. But rather, it seems that Peter, when he's saying the preparing is much more about preparing our posture and our attitude in defending ourselves to others. And not necessarily in giving the perfect answers, but rather in giving the answer in such a way that really reflects Christ in how we are gentle and we are respectful. And we don't take offense to people's misunderstandings or not knowing or even just straight hostility towards the things that we believe. I mean, this, this teaching that Peter is giving, which is, if you're familiar with the gospel, it's just echoing Jesus' teaching. You know, this idea of being gentle and kind, of taking, not repaying evil for evil, turning the other cheek, right? Blessing those who curse us. You know, this is, it's so countercultural. It, it certainly was then, and it certainly is now. I mean, then, as, just as now, now we have, you know, we have X, formerly Twitter, we have all these platforms to yell at each other and debate. They did too. They had the same types of platforms and areas and things to debate on, and they put their things on boards and the town squares and all kinds of terrible things about different groups and different peoples and philosophies. It was just, this is what you did. You debated and you harassed each other over political ideas and, and divisions. This idea of showing respect to people who don't show respect to you, I mean, just sounds nonsensical. Waiting to be asked about what you believe rather than loudly and regularly trying to convince people what you believe. When asked, a gentle, being gentle and respectful in how we talk rather than this caustic back and forth debating. It's just, it's, it's, it's difficult to even imagine what that looks like in our culture today or what that would look like in their culture or in our culture to actually try to do this. So I think it's helpful to sit in that for a little bit, to sit a little bit into this, what this Peter is calling us to. I mean, Peter is calling the church, all Christians everywhere, everyone, everywhere, to live a life that doesn't respond to the hostility of culture with hostility. That doesn't pay back injustice for injustice, that doesn't just shout louder and louder because everybody else is shouting louder and louder, but rather calling us as Christians to live a quiet life of hope and gentleness and respect for everyone, not just those who agree with us or support us or protect us, but rather we look to bless those around us, especially those who are against us. And in this way, right, we live a life that reflects Jesus and makes the gospel beautiful and attractive to all people. A life where we don't take offense, but still do what is right, Peter says, right? Now, again, the calling, we got to be really clear, right? Peter's not calling the church to never offend people. Like, we will, we are offensive. The existence of Christians is offensive, It was offensive to the Romans. It's offensive to our culture. I mean, any religion that tells you you can't save yourself, you're not that great, you need help, (laughs) that's offensive. Jesus was a very offensive figure. That we will be, our presence and our belief system is offensive. All belief systems are offensive at some level. The, The calling is not that Christians won't be offensive. It's that we won't be offended. That we won't always take offense to everybody else this is views of us and their treatment of us. Our calling is, ne- is not to never offend, but rather not to take offense by the hurts and the mistreatments of others. Now, it makes it so hard, because I mean, I think on, on some level, we all love this idea. And all people love this idea, Christians, non-Christians. Um, everyone likes the thought of blessing your enemies and not repaying evil for evil or injustice for injustice. Um, yeah, it's great. And we've got great 
memorials set up to people who lived this way. You know, everyone looks up to various figures like Mother Teresa or Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr. or, you know, Jesus at all of these things. We love it. We think this is great. We just don't think it will actually work. So it's hard to actually live this way because it's hard to actually believe that this is the way that we will win over people for Christ or that we will live a good life. It seems like if I, if I don't stand up for myself, if I don't stand up for my rights, if I don't start shouting back, I mean, I'm just going to get run over. My family's going to get run over. We're going to get run over. Like, this isn't the way this works in the world. This is a great ideal. Yeah, it'd be great if everybody loved their enemies. But I'm not, I don't know that I'll be the one who will do it. Because if we honestly evaluate how we react... Because all of us have been trained through culture, through upbringing, all kinds of things. Even though we believe this teaching, we may believe this idea, you know, we've trained ourselves to react to things. And I mean, if we honestly think about how we react to feeling disregarded, unprotected, mistreated, made fun of, not at home, in exile, right, in any sphere of our life. I mean, we, we may feel like this in all of the spheres of our life, if it's feeling unprotected by the government, if it's feeling unloved or cared for at home, at work, in our neighborhoods, with our friends. I mean, like, how do we respond to these feelings when we feel mistreated, when we feel slandered, we feel like nobody gets us? How do you respond? How do we as a group respond? How do Christians typically respond to these types of feelings, right? And I think that we have two main ways that we tend to respond uh, to these types of feelings when we feel really mistreated or misjudged or hurt or unprotected uh, that has become kind of the, the standard way that we've learned to operate, right? The first, I think the first way we do it is we take offense and we fight back. You mistreated me. You hurt me. You didn't protect me. You, you know, I'm hurt by this. I take offense to this and now I'm going to fight back. And we do that by lashing out if it's a fit of ang- fits of anger or lashing out at whoever it is, our boss, our spouse, our children, our friends, you know, we, we're hurt, and so we want to hurt back. We repay evil for evil, we hurt back. Or if we don't want to hurt that person, we will just slander that person. You know, we'll talk about the hurt that that person caused us to other people so that we make sure that everyone else knows what happened because I, you know, I... I I can't let this just go. Uh, People need to know what they've done or what they're doing. Or we talk about our we talk about our government leaders in a really disrespectful way, not to their face, but to to everybody else. Or we talk about our spouse in a disrespectful way, not to their face, but to you know we we tend to go sideways with our our slander and our gossip to really because we've been hurt, we feel pain, or we become activists in this hurt or pain, and we say fine. This isn't going to happen again. I'm going to go make a change and make change happen, and I'm going to fight for this group or for my group or for this one that been, that's been mistreated. Over time, we go on the offensive because we took offense. I think some of us have got that, right? It's this kind of fight and flight. Some of us are fighters, <laughs> and we react that way. Some of us uh, like to fly, like to flee, and that would certainly be the other response, I think, as well we tend to do, right? You take offense to things, and then we just retreat. And we say, fine, you want to be that like that? That's okay. I don't have to live by you. I don't have to live in the city anymore. I don't have to be around these people anymore. Um, I'm just going to go. I'm out of here. And so we move and we avoid. We avoid the people who have hurt us. We avoid the boss who has hurt us. We avoid the neighbor that we think may doesn't like us. We, we just start to avoid people that have hurt us because we have felt maligned or hurt by them. So just avoid it. Um, and we hold on, though. Right? We keep holding on to the past wrongs that they have done and keep a tally. Some of us are good at keeping tallies or lists in our heads of everything that people have done to us. And, you know, we're never going to bring it out, but at least it helps us then to know who we have a beef with or we're not comfortable with. And in that retreating, that tends to lead to that real fear, too. We're constantly afraid, constantly troubled, 
constantly thinking about or, or hearing the news about those people or those groups or those things and always how terrible they are and how bad it is and I'm glad I don't live there where those people are or, you know, you just, you just, it's always this fear, a lot of fear, a lot of fear. And in both c- cases, if it's the lashing out or if it's the running away when we take offense, our conscience isn't clean. Our conscience isn't good, right? And that's what Peter says, right? Like, you're not going to live with a clear conscience this way because you're holding on to wrongs. You're holding on to sin. You're, you're, you're not living in this peace. We're not at peace, and we lose our ability to be a witness in either place, and which has certainly been the, the truth for Christianity in America over the last 50, 60 years, right? I mean, it's really undermined the Christian witness through either militant responses in culture or through a retreating away from culture in both cases, I mean, it's not, Christianity has not been winsome in either of those, of those two postures towards culture. But what I think what Peter and what Jesus, what Christianity is offering us is a third way of handling hurt. Rather than having to just take offense and fight or take offense and run away, we can, we can be hurt but not offended. Like we can be hurt, really hurt. I mean, they were hurt. What they went through was unjust and wrong, and really wrong. But we don't have to be offended. We can still seek and pursue peace, Peter says here at the beginning, to pursue peace as a community rather than fight. And how can we do this? How can we not take offense to being mistreated and maligned and misunderstood? Well, and Peter goes into this now in verses 18 through 22, right? I mean, he understands how hard of a message this is that he just gave, you know, and he's given it now several times through 1 Peter, and he gets it every time he tells us again about Christ because he knows, like, this, this is too hard. <laughs> this isn't going to make a lot of sense to love people like this unless we can remind ourselves of how Christ did it. We need to be reminded Christ is the example and the means by which we do this. Jesus is the only truly good person, right? The only one who is actually deserving of a reward of glory, but instead of getting the glory that he deserved, he suffered in the place of all the terrible people, which turns out is all of us, right? He, he, the one righteous died for the unrighteous. The one good took the place of the terrible. The one who didn't deserve to suffer actually suffered on behalf of everyone who does deserve to suffer, right? And why? He says, to put to death the flesh and to be raised alive in the spirit. So Christ died in his death. That part of us that always wants to respond with evil too, died with him. My mistakes, my past, my record of wrongs, my terrible responses to my circumstances, my mistreatments of others are gone. Died when he died. And Christ rose from the dead and is gone ahead of us into heaven, Peter says, right? It's to show us this future then that also awaits. That responses, I don't have to respond the same way that I've always responded because that part of me died when Christ died. And I don't have to be afraid because I also know who I really am and what's awaiting me, this true home and this true self that's with Christ. And when he comes back, all things will be made new. And so what this does, Peter says, right, is it gives us a good conscience. If Christ has cleansed us, if, every, if that part of me is now gone, I, I don't have to respond this way anymore. If the part of me that responds so badly has died, and it isn't always going to be a part of me, I don't have to keep living in it. I don't have to keep responding the same way that I've always been responding. It has no power over me anymore. Right, the flesh is still the flesh. Right, and we can, this is very this is getting a little overly Christiany. Sorry about that. You know, in Colossians, but it's like these responses are always going to be there. We're always going to want to respond as long until we have new bodies. But I don't have to keep responding that way any longer because of what Christ has done. He put that to death and has risen and given us the Spirit. I don't have to keep living that way, and I know that my future is secure. This new home, new family new body. I don't have to worry about this world so much. It takes away the fear and that constant need to defend ourselves. Jesus knows me and sees me, right? Like 
Psalm 34. I mean, his eyes are on me. His ears are open to me. God is, he is with, like, I may not be understood by my government. I might not be understood by my spouse. I might not be understood by my neighbor. But God knows me, and he understands me, and he hears me, and sees me. And this faith then becomes an identity and a protection, right? Like, that's what Peter says here at the end. This, your baptism is like the ark for Noah, right? Like that baptismal moment, it's, a, it's like the ark. In the, in the storm, oh, like it, it, it provides that safety. At least I know who I, at least I know, right, who I am in Jesus Christ. At least I have this clear and good conscience. I have been washed and redeemed and am in Christ. When everything else is falling away on me, I have this, and I'm safe and secure in God. Which means I don't have to live in this constant fear. So I can have hope in the midst of suffering and disparagement and persecution in this life. So now what does that look like then, right, to, in, in kind of practical terms in our lives? I think what this looks like, again, is for us is, and it looked like for them and it looks like for us, this truth is great, but this is going to require of the people of God some retraining, retraining ourselves in how we respond to things, retraining ourselves in how we respond to mistreatments and hurts. The first is this, we've been trained over by culture and by time in to respond a certain way when someone hurts us or says something to us or does something or just believes something we don't agree in. We, we have these tendencies we want to respond in. Where do we look to, where do we run to when those things happen? Do we run to comfort when we are hurt? Do we run to God in his grace who gives us countless opportunities to grow in this every day, right? I mean, like, if you want to become more gentle and kind and respect, following the pattern of Christ, Christ has graciously given us opportunities to do this daily. But you can't really get through a day without feeling, uh, to some degree, hurt, disregarded, ignored, snubbed, or attacked by someone through the day. And it's really hard to go through your day not feeling bad or hurt by someone. Right? Why is this? <laughs> well, because the flesh is still going. And I still then am given these opportunities to train myself in the gospel and in how I'm going to respond. Where do I turn? How do I respond to feeling hurt and disregarded? How do you respond? Do you avoid and distract yourself, medicate yourself? Do you lash out and pay back people when they hurt you? Or do you look to Christ, right, who suffered far worse for you, and have your heart softened? and be able to endure suffering with kindness and bless those who hurt you. So we have to start to retrain our responses. We also have to start to train or retrain how we even live our lives. And I think that's what, what Peter's really trying to emphasize for them too, this opportunity now in this new land to think about how you're actually living your life, not just how we respond to being hurt, but also, I mean, just how are we living how much fear and conflict are you taking in on a daily basis? I mean, it's just, it's just impossible not to take it in. If it's through social media and the news, I mean, we, just, we just consume so much that is just designed to inflame us and enrage and cause fear and division. And the more we, we take this in, the more we live in those types of realities, I mean, how, how can we become, how can we be gentle? <laughs> how can we be respectful? How can we show honor? If, if all we hear are talking heads or things that are always promoting the very opposite. We need to be spending more time doing good, right? Peter says to devote ourselves to doing good. Do good. Work hard at your work. Invest in your relationships that you have. Invest in your neighbors and your friends, in your spouse, in your children. Seek peace and justice in the city. Like, devote yourself to good, and that does, that does, we're going to need to retrain a little bit of how we spend our time and put our money and our energies into things and less divisive, angry, debating, constant outrage and fear and more into seeking good and seeking justice. Ultimately, a lot of it comes down to in just embracing the fact that we are exiles, right? Embracing this fact that this world is not our home. 
we need to change our mindset. It was easy for them, at least, to just, they knew this, that they were exiles. We are as well. We feel, we, we feel the same ways, but, it, but we still want this to be home, even though it feels like it's changing underneath us. But we need to change our mindset and understand that calling. Our calling is not to be blessed, to live this like comfortable, blessed life where everything is going to be great and we will never suffer persecution, where we'll never be misunderstood, where we'll always have Christians around us and everything will be great. But rather, our calling is to serve and to bless others, which means entering into relationship with people who don't understand us, who will hurt us, who don't always get things the way that we get things and will mistreat us. As we wait for Christ to make this world our home, we're to love and we're to serve and live lives that reflect this hope and peace, gentleness and respect. And to do this, and we're going to need to be constantly reminded of our calling and our future that awaits us.